Hello, every, oh, I'll start. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Martha Naro. I work at Cybers, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar on EvoLink. It's a tool that helps with identification and evolutionary analysis of long non-coding RNAs. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Andrew to introduce himself. Thanks, Martha. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Nelson. I'm a postdoc here at the University of Arizona in the School of Plant Sciences. Um, and as Martha said, today I'm going to talk to you about a couple of apps that we've developed um, primarily in the discovery environment to help identify and then perform kind of some evolutionary analyses on long encoding RNAs. And before I get started, I'm going to let a pinter introduce himself um, so that he's not just a, a voice in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Upendra Devsetty. Uh, I'm a science informatician at Cybers. Uh, I'm collaborating with Andrew Nelson on the Everlink project, and I'll be speaking on Everlink 1 a little later in the presentation. Okay, so uh, just to remind you guys, that this, this won't be as big of a deal if we all become panelists and we can all inter uh, interrupt each other at, at, at random, but uh, feel free to ask questions at any point uh, through the, the chat box. Um, I will try to uh, look at the, the chat box uh, periodically and, and respond, or we'll stop and take a break and respond. Um, okay, so let's, let's get started. And with a little bit of a, an outline of what we're gonna be talking about today, of course, we're gonna be talking about EvoLink, um, but I'm gonna give you an introduction about long energetic or long non-coding RNAs. Um, then we'll have any kind of questions, field any questions that you guys might have about uh, link RNAs. And then we'll go through a brief description of EvoLink 1, followed with, by a demo of EvoLink 1 in the discovery environments. And then a description of EvoLink 2 and a demo of it in the discovery environments. And of course, we'll have time for, for questions throughout all of these uh, slides. Okay, so in general, um, if we're talking about transcripts, uh, long non-coding RNAs make up a large, um, unknown, but very large percentage of eukaryotic transcriptomes. Um, and what I'm showing here is just a, a random chromosome or segment of a chromosome. And in green, you see the green dots are, are protein coding loci. Um, and then, of course, sprinkled throughout, what we've, we've found in the last five or so years is that sprinkled throughout, um, what we originally thought was empty space is actually a whole bunch of um, transcribed RNAs, and many of these are uh, what we would consider long non-coding RNAs. Long non-coding RNAs are primarily, um, I guess, uh, described by what they're not. So they are not, or they have little or no protein coding potential. So typically, um, the accepted parameter is less than 100 amino acids worth of, of protein coding. Uh, potential. They're lowly expressed or they may be tissue specific. Um, on average, they display poor sequence conservation across uh, species. They are difficult to predict computationally from genomic information alone. So you really need some kind of transcriptomic data to infer uh, uh, link RNAs. And on top of all this, as I'll talk about a, a little bit more, link RNAs, there, there's very few link RNAs with uh, known function. So it's, it's really difficult to distinguish between what you would consider background transcriptional noise um, and functional long encoding RNAs. And of course, there's, there's a lot of debates as to what is background and what is functional. Um, I don't want to get into that today. I'm going to, to say that functional in this, in my context, means biologically performing some kind of function that we can measure. Um, okay. So long non-coding RNAs, the nomenclature for long non-coding RNAs is derived from genomic location relative to protein coding genes. So um, here again, we have a protein coding gene and there are several classes of long non-coding RNAs that are named by whether or how they overlap um, a protein coding gene. So for instance, there's an overlapping non-coding RNA that could be intronically derived, or it could be an alternative isoform that doesn't encode for a protein. Um, there's natural antisense non-coding RNAs. These are transcribed in the opposite direction of a protein coding gene. And then there's the gene-associated non-coding RNAs that are transcribed relatively close, either in the um, uh, sense or antisense direction. And you could think of some of these, at least, as being enhancer RNAs or regulating the transcription of 
the, the gene that they're adjacent to. And typically we can think of all of these uh, RNAs as being somehow associated with uh, the, the protein coding gene that they're overlapping. Now over here, way out in energetic space, um, far away from a protein coding gene, are your class of long energetic non-coding RNAs. Um, and these are the ones we're gonna focus on because um, these RNAs are easier to distinguish uh, from all these others um, in terms of like analyzing RNA-seq data. And um, they tend to be functionally distinct from any other kind of overlapping gene. And also they're easier to examine from an evolutionary context. In terms of major known functions, there tends to be four kind of accepted uh, uh, classes or, or functional classifications for long non-coding RNAs, and I'm gonna bring them all up here. And I'm gonna uh, tell you to look at a couple of really good reviews and then a primary research article um, talking about uh, long non-coding non RNAs and their classification. Um, but in general, you can have chromatin-associated link RNAs doing something, either epigenetics or transcriptional regulation. You have RNA and protein processing. This can be antisense or this can be RNAs that are actually like really highly conserved and are involved in, in uh, translation um, and in splicing. So your tRNAs, your splicing RNAs, splicing someone RNAs, et cetera. Um, these guys are, are uh, different um, because they're, again, much more conserved than uh, your, your typical link RNAs. And then you have a couple of, um, I'd say, specialized classes because we don't have a, a lot of really good examples for these RNAs, but you have the molecular decoy where the link RNA is acting to uh, soak away or, or, or kind of steal proteins or RNA binding partners from another transcript. Um, and then you have the chromatin independent scaffold of which the telomerase RNA is a really good example where you're acting, the link RNA is, is acting to bring together a whole bunch of proteins for some kind of biological function that doesn't depend on a, on a chromatin context. Okay, so I'm giving you like these four major classifications, but what I should emphasize is that, especially in humans, uh, a large proportion of link RNAs have no known function. And if you're talking about all of eukaryotes, we're, we're talking about like 99.99, you know, something percent. Because while we can identify link RNAs, you know, in, in a fairly okay context, we finding a function for these things is, is really uh, uh, difficult so far. And we'll talk about reasons uh, why. So here I'm showing you a really nice figure from a really good review um, by Capusta and Fashot. And what I want you to look at is here on the right, um, this is kind of a eukaryotic tree of life heavily sampled towards uh, mammals, of course. And we're looking at proteins that have been identified in each of these species. And then in blue, we're the link RNAs that have been identified in each of these species. Um, and I think you, you'll see by the size of the blue circle that a lot of link RNAs have been identified in mammals um, and then in vertebrates. Um, but very few um, link RNAs have been identified outside of, of this clade. So insects, for instance, um, plants are another. This, this review is a little bit dated, you know, it's two years old. There have been some uh, link RNAs identified in, in more species, but I think that the trend still stands that link RNAs have predominantly been identified um, in the vertebrate lineage, and again, more heavily sampled towards uh, mammals. And um, what this is saying is that all other, all other eukaryotic lineages are lagging far behind, both in terms of RNA, link RNAs identified and in publication numbers um, on link RNAs. And so what we've uh, tried to do is set out, um, develop an app that will help people fill out this tree by streamlining the link RNA identification process. Um, because we think that a better link RNA data set, a eukaryotic link RNA data set, will allow for more detailed functional and evolutionary analyses. So we're gonna stop here and see if anybody has any questions, but while we're taking questions, I wanna leave you guys with a few take home thoughts to, to ponder. Um, so first, there are, again, to reiterate, there are a few, or surprisingly few species for which link RNAs have been identified. This is in contrast to the amount of RNA-seq data that's available. There's a lot of RNA-seq data out there. Um, we believe that the uh, poor curation of link RNAs hampers the comparative uh, and functional studies of link RNAs. 
And we're about to, in the next couple of minutes, introduce an app that will help in link RNA identification. Okay, so questions, and Martha has a question first for everybody to see if she wants to allow you guys to speak back. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um, let you guys talk. Do you wanna do that? I, I'm, I'm, let's see, Amy's saying no, anybody else? Otherwise, if you have questions, you can also type them into the chat window. We'll give you, give you just a sec, but I'm happy to let people speak. Ah, okay. Everybody's shy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, I, no, yeah, I, I, we have an op open office environment here too, so. Okay, are there any questions for Andrew at this point? Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay. So you guys um, probably, maybe since you're already interested in link RNAs, all of this was was really just a, an unnecessary review. Um, so let's talk about EvoLink One. So like I said, EvoLink in general is a is a two part uh, series of apps. There's EvoLink One, which is uh, going to do the link RNA identification, and then there's EvoLink Two, which we'll talk about later, that does the comparative evolution or genomics and transcriptomics analyses for you. Um, so um, within the, the discovery environment, EvoLink naturally plugs into your RNA-seq assembly workflow. So we do have, uh, we, well, we do have um, EvoLink available as open source, but I mean, I'm really gonna have to, to promote the computing uh, uh, resources available in the discovery environment. And Again, what I've been doing with EvoLink uh, 1 and 2 is, is you have your top hat, your cufflinks, or your any, any other RNA-seq assembly and, um, platform, and then I just immediately go from, from uh, cuff merge or cufflinks to uh, EvoLink 1. Um, and it just, it, it makes sense. All, all the, the apps work together, um, and I think it's really powerful. So with that plug aside, let's go ahead and talk about EvoLink 1. And EvoLink 1 is going to be described by a pincher, so I'm going to switch seats with him. <coughs> okay, hi everyone again. <coughs> so as Andrew mentioned, um, EvoLink 1 is the first part of the EvoLink uh, pipeline. EvoLink is mainly designed uh, to streamline uh, long non on pipeline. We do acknowledge that uh, this pipeline is not the only one available out there but but the fact that this is the only app available in discovery environment for long, long non-coding audience uh, feels as exciting so what i'm going to do in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes is to tell you a little bit about the workflow um, that's happening behind the scenes of evolink one and also um, we'll show you how to actually uh, use evolink one app within the discovery environment Okay, so a little bit about the workflow for uh, long non coding on detection. So uh, there are three minimal requirements uh, for using Everlink 1. Uh, the first one is the cuff compare or cuff match uh, generated GTF file. And the second one is the genome reference because for blasting um, purposes. And the third one is the GFF file. As Andrew mentioned, you need to have uh, support for G uh, transcriptome in order to um, identify long non coding So it all starts with taking the uh, cuff compare or cuff merge GDF files and all transcripts that doesn't correspond to a known protein coding genes will be filtered out because we need this uh, for the rest of the workflow. And these transcripts have further been filtered by length. Uh, so in this case, we are going to use a uh, length of 200, greater than 200 base pairs because this is the cutoff that have been recommended or being used by the uh, long non coding on a uh, community. Once these uh, transcripts have been filtered by base 200 base pairs length, uh, they have been further subjected to two further filters. One is they should not have any open reading frame and they should not blast to any known proteins. We do this using trans decoder. 
and in an optional steps all these filtered uh, transcripts will be further blasted to a transposable elements database uh, again we understand that the transposable elements database may not be available for all the species that you guys will be working on but that's why we made this um, uh, optional but the other thing that you can do is you can uh, collect all the transposable elements from a uh, related species and use this because we realize that this is uh, even though it's an optional step it's an important step so once these fil uh, transcripts have been filtered by blasting them to the uh, transposable elements all the non-blast uh, transcripts will be taken and then they will be uh, compared against the um, the genome annotation file to test if they overlap with any known genes so if they do overlap with any known genes then they will be separated uh, on bo um, for both strands of the DNA, whether they are sense overlapping transcripts and then uh, anti sense overlapping transcripts. So, whatever that is left uh, after surviving all these filters were considered as putative long non coding RNAs, which are shown at the uh, right, uh, right end of the workflow. Even though this workflow looks very basic, there is so much coding that happens behind the uh, scenes of this workflow. So um, even though uh, the long non-coding RNAs are generated uh, at the end of the evolving one, in addition, we do provide uh, some other outputs, which you will see in a minute, but I'll explain here briefly. briefly. Uh, the first one is the long non-coding RNAs uh, in the form of bad file, um, because as most of the people will be um, interested in this kind of format because they want to visualize this in some genome browsers of their interest. So we provide them. And we also provide another important uh, additional output, uh, which is an updated uh, genome annotation of the uh, cuff links, uh, cuff, cuff compare, uh, cuff merge output. Uh, the main advantage of having this output is they can, the users can use this uh, uh, use this uh, to do some downstream analysis such as differential gene expression to find out if there is any uh, gene that is differential expressed and then see if that gene is actually a long non-coding RNA. And uh, last but not least is the link on your demographics file. Uh, this is a text file. Again, I'm going to show that in a minute. This is a text file where uh, it shows some of the statistics of the long non-coding RNA such as uh, the number of unique long non coronaries, uh, how many of those have isoforms, the total length, maximum, minimum, and 50, and so on. Okay, so let's hop on to the discovery environment for some uh, live demo. Hope I'm keeping my fingers crossed to see if everything works okay. Okay, so. Okay, so before I start the live demo, uh, I want to point you guys to this wiki uh, page that is on the Cybers wiki. Uh, we, we will provide you the link for this, but if you want to uh, access this now, you can just type in the ever link uh, in the search box and this will be the first uh, hit because there's no other uh, wikis with this name. Anyway, so um, we, we we made a, an extensive wiki document for the Everlink because we realized that since this is a relatively new app, people might benefit just by looking at this. And so we decided to make this as extensive as possible. Again, uh, your comments and feedback are welcome. There's a chart, uh, there's a uh, comments box at the end of this uh, wiki where the users can enter a comment and we will try to address uh, as early as possible. Okay, so. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of each of this, but um, um, I'm going to go and start with the prerequisites for Everlink 1. So one of the main prerequisites of using Everlink 1, or in fact any app in, um, in Cybers, is you need to register uh, with Cybers. Uh, Pendra, can I interrupt you for a second, ask you to bump up the font just a little bit? Yeah. How about this? That's good. Thank you. Okay, so uh, 
So registering to cybers and using the credentials is one of the uh, prerequisites of using uh, any app in the discovery environment. You can register uh, yourself at cyber at users.cybers.org uh, in less than a minute. And then uh, once you validate your credentials, you're good to go. So um, the other more, the other important prerequisites is an up-to-date Java-enabled web browser because the Discover environment is a web browser-based graphical user interface. Uh, so we need to have an updated um, uh, updated Java-enabled web browser uh, to to do several things. Like if you want to up, uh, upload some files, uh, some of those old version doesn't work well. Uh, compared to the new version. Even though I'm using Chrome here, uh, Firebar, Fire, Firefox is the recommended web, web, web browser. Okay, so as I said, uh, Everlink 1 needs three uh, minimal requirements, of compare output file, uh, reference genome file, and the reference genome annotation file in TFF format. And in addition, uh, Everlink 1 also um, also can be used with some other uh, input files such as transposable elements. Uh, this is an optional, as I indicated in my earlier slide. Uh, and the other two important files which we think will certainly help the users is the transcription of star site uh, file in GFA format. Again, we understand that this may not be the case for all the species, but uh, having that actually helps you um, uh, get more information out of Everlink 1. Similarly, uh, if there's any known long known coding onions already available uh, for your species of interest, you can provide them. And what Everlink 1 does is to check to see if any of those uh, identified long known coding onions will actually match to the known link onions. In this way, you'll have unique and you'll have the um, non unique ones. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, so for the current webinar and also for testing purposes, we provided some uh, test data set uh, in the discovery environment. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and show where the test data is, as well as uh, show you how to use the app with this test data. So I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, open the discovery environment. Here are the uh, URL for the discovery environment, and then I already registered myself with the cyber so uh, i'm logging in with my cyber's credentials um, okay so okay i'm going to close this window for now so as you can see here discovery environment is a very neat um user interface with not much of fuss on the desktop this reminds you of your desktop but certainly not mine. Uh, so as you can see here, there are three windows, data, apps, and analysis. Since this uh, webinar is not about discovery environment, I'm not going to go uh, into the details of what, of what each of this window is for, but I'll, I'm gonna click on the apps because we need this uh, for uh, running our Everlink one. So if you have not been using discovery environment for the past one week or so, you realize that the app user interface has changed a little bit. Uh, previously, the apps are categorized uh, in a hierarchical fashion, but now the apps has been ca ca categorized using EDM ontology. Again, you don't need to worry about what exactly EDM ontology and all. So um, the easiest way to search for an app within discovery environment is to use the search box to enter the keyboard for the app. In this case, I'm going to enter Everlink 1. And then it- Sandra, sorry again. Could you um, increase the font just a little bit? Thank you, that's good. Okay, so um, I just entered Everlink 1 and then it um, it showed two results. Uh, this is because of uh, fuzzy searching. You don't need to worry about that. So again, we still need these two apps. Uh, I'll talk about Everlink 1 now, and then Andrew will talk about Everlink 2. So I'll just click on the Everlink 1, and then it in turn opens another window. So I'm going to minimize this for now. Uh, so so this is a user interface for uh, for most of the app. This is basic um, user interface for most of the apps. On the top panel, what you have is the analysis name uh, followed by the comments box. Like this is useful uh, if you want to put some comments on the type of analysis you're running. For example, if you're uh, running the same app with multiple parameters, so it's good to uh, have that information 
in here. And uh, the third um, thing on the top panel is the uh, path to the output file. Uh, so it's by default, the path to the output file is your, your user space and is a folder called analysis. Uh, I tend to keep this as it is, but uh, you are welcome to change this if you want. And the final uh, uh, item on the top panel is if you want to retain inputs. Again, I tend not to click on this option because I don't want to have multiple uh, multiple uh, files throughout my uh, work area. So uh, okay. So the other thing is like the README. README basically tells you what exactly this app does, uh, and uh, sometimes they also uh, the integrators of the app normally provide the wiki page where you can click and then see or how exactly the app runs and the inputs there are three mandatory inputs as i mentioned uh, before so i'm not going to go uh, into details of that again and there are three optional outputs and then uh, here is the name of the output file uh, so again i don't Again, it's up to the individuals if, you, if they want to uh, change the name of the default uh, folder name, but in this case, we'll just leave it as it is. Okay, so in order to use this, uh, in order to test this app, so we need some test data, test data. So what I'm going to do is to navigate to my data store and then uh, figure out where the test data is. So for that, for that purpose, so I'm going to go ahead and click on this, uh, the first icon and then say snap right and then click on the data uh, window as 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 i said at the beginning of my um into the, uh, the beginning of the discovery on domain uh, so this is one of the uh, windows on the discovery on domain so this window is basically the data store and the data store has uh, four different uh, folders the first folder is a user specific folder so this is the uh, you can store all your uh, data and the second one is the community data community data is where the data can be accessed by everyone of course you need to have uh, cyber credentials if you want to use this and the third one is the shared with me for example if some if some uh, cyber user wants to share some data and if they do then you will see the data in here and finally trash so nothing gets deleted until you remove from the trash. So uh, so you can always go back and um, retrieve from the trash. Okay, for the current analysis, I'm going to click on this button again and then say uh, snap left. I'll close this thing. And then um, for the testing purposes of Everlink one, uh, I'm gonna click on the community data. I plan collaborate to example data and as you can see here there's lots of folders on the uh, under the example data each of this is corresponds to an app uh, it, so all the apps may not have an example data but we make sure that uh, at least a, as much as we can provide them with the uh, app so for current purposes we need to navigate to the evolving uh, sample data and then uh, within the Avalanche sample data, there are two folders, each corresponding to each of the app. So I'm going to click on the Avalanche one, and then um, clicking on that will uh, show you six different files. Each one will go into each of these inputs. So, um, so there are two ways to input data into uh, app. Either you can browse to a particular folder, or you can drag and drop from data store to the uh, app. So I'm going to go and do the dra dragging thing because in this way, then I don't need to click multiple browsers. And it is faster this way as well. Okay, so for uh, Kafka compare output file, so we provided a sample Kafka compare output file. And for the reference genome, we provided the uh, Arab Dobson's reference genome file. And the transcriptome annotation or the genome annotation file is the t10 again from arabdopsis we also provided the optional arguments again uh, the the users doesn't need to input this and the app still runs fine but you don't get additional information if you don't provide this yeah. and then the transposable elements goes in here uh, transcriptional start site in here 
and finally uh, no uh, link on yes goes in here and output again as i said earlier uh, tend to leave it as default so once you make sure that all the inputs have been entered and once you're happy with everything uh, we can go ahead and click on the launch analysis and then it takes uh, less than a minute or so to go into the submission mode and from there to um, run mode and finally to the completed so the first message that you'll see here is that the app has been submitted to the uh, discover and ramen uh, queues and the second miss the second notification for every app is basically it tells you that the app has started running and the final notification is that the app has finished so uh, in the interest of time, um, I'm not going to go and wait until the analysis has finished. So what I'll do is I will, I have already run the an analysis before the webinar. So I'm going to now get to this folder and then show you uh, how the output looks like. So I'll close this data store for now and then click on the analysis. So if you look at the analysis, uh, the first one, is the one that we're currently running and it says the status is running and uh, and as i said earlier i have run uh, the analysis before so this is the uh, name of the analysis so i'll click here so clicking on that will again take us to the data store uh, if you remember i said that the uh, that the output of each of this uh, app will be uh, in uh, will be outputted to a folder within your user space which is the analysis so uh, each app generates at least a logs folder and then some output files it all depends on how the app has been uh, coded in this case uh, we coded the app to generate a folder uh, and within that folder you see different kinds of uh, outputs uh, so since it is hard to uh, see see everything what's happening in here, so I'm going to go and switch back to the wiki and explain you uh, what each of these outputs are. So the first output, as I mentioned earlier, is the uh, long non code non yes in the faster format. Uh, this is straightforward and uh, easy to understand. The other output is the the same long non code non yes in the bad format. And the third one, as again, as I indicated earlier, is an updated GTR file that incorporates the information that we gather from running Everlink 1. And the demographic file is a text file that basically shows some stats on the um, long non calling on. Yes, in this case, uh, we detected uh, 154 uh, unique long non calling on. Yes. And including the isoforms, it counts to 180. This is a very subset, I mean, this is a very small subset of Arabidopsis chromosome one. So that's where the numbers are like, little low. Uh, and then it also provides like, what's the largest long non non yes, and then the total length. Uh, and the other most important file that you should be looking at is the final summary table. This basically is a CSV file with a bunch of columns. Uh, the first column is basically the name of the long non coding on yes, that is the ID, followed by the size. And if you have provided the uh, Evolink one with an overlapping um, non, uh, known link on yes uh, file, then you see that uh, for each of these long non coding on yes, Evolink will. Uh, will search to see if there's any overlapping with a known long non coding on yes if if there's if there's an overlap then it checks to see what's the gene id of the overlapping um uh, long non coding on yes in this case this uh, this is some id that is coming from the known long non coding on yes in addition if we have provided the uh, trans um transcriptional start site data uh, the Evolink one will try to search if the long, if the five prime end of the long first exon of long non coding on ye uh, lies within hundred base pairs distance of the um, distance, and then if so, then it will say yes. If not, if say, if not, then it will say no. And finally, uh, the final column basically shows how many exons are there for the particular long non coding on ye. 
So we, we think that this is very useful file. And uh, he, this is just a snapshot, but within the discovery environment, you can go ahead and uh, sort the columns and then um, do whatever you want to do, the same that you do in the Excel. And um, we also provide a, a, a pie chart that basically um, indicates what are the ratios of the different types of long non-coding onions. In this case, known link onion corresponds to around 25% of the total long non-coding onions, and case link onions, which is the transcriptional start site, corresponds to 4% of the total uh, long non-coding onions. Uh, and uh, if you have provided uh, um, the TSS and overlapping, then uh, you get a foster file uh, for those particular ones as well. And uh, for benchmarking purposes, we also provide an elapsed time evolving one dot text file, which basically shows how long does each of the step. This is useful for troubleshooting like purposes. And um, the one that we provided is just for uh, a subset of data. And finally, uh, we, uh, uh, if you remember from Andrew Stock and my dog, that uh, long non coding years can be classified into the class like uh, anti sense overlapping transcripts and uh, sense overlapping transcripts. We capture that information and we put that in one folder along with uh, those transcripts that flash to the transposable elements. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. So, uh, the, the app is publicly available, uh, the test data is publicly available, uh, the instructions are there on the wiki, so please use it. We need as much feedback as possible, and uh, we are happy to uh, modify the app uh, based on your request. Thank you, and now Andy will uh, take over the rest of the presentation. Thank you. You've got a question, Upendra. Where do you get the TSS file? Yes, so Andrew can take it over. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, thanks, Upendra, for uh, a great demo of Evo Link 1. Um, so Songli, the, the transcription start site information uh, is, is generated by the community. So for instance, we got uh, this transcription start site information from, uh, uh, I think, Molly McGraw uh, at Oregon State. Um, I know that, so this can be CAGE data, this can be PEATS data. Um, you can download it from, um, like if there's an ensemble or, or um, you know, the, the human, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the, the human uh, website. But uh, basically you, you would get this information um, off, you know, from a collaborator, from the internet, et cetera. Um, is, that a, is that a sufficient uh, response? Okay. Okay. Does EvoLink have the ability to identify and distinguish between long, highly conserved non-coding DNA regions from link RNA in terms of identifying pseudogenes? Um, okay. So that is a great question, and part of that's going to rely on EvoLink too. Um, but in terms of identifying link RNAs within um, um, so, so say you're just wanting to identify link RNAs and you're using EvoLink 1, um, which is just based on transcriptional uh, information. Um, when you use a genome annotation, so one of the, the um, requirements, one of the input files for EvoLink 1 is a reference genome annotation file. So, um, sorry, I'm looking for the prerequisites. Okay, so some kind of uh, reference genome annotation file right here. Um, what you can do, so again, pseudogenes have been identified in some species. They haven't been in others. Some like don't distinguish between pseudogenes or not. So some genome annotation files have long encoding RNA, RNAs in them. So one thing that I like to do is to actually strip down the annotation file so that it's just protein coding genes remove all of the um, pseudogenes or other information, uh, other genes, if that's available, um, and then run EvoLink just uh, using the reference uh, genome with the protein coding genes. Um, and what that is going to do is it's going to tell you how many, of, how many other transcripts uh, are out there that are not associated with known um, genes that are not protein coding genes. Um, then you can go back 
and repeat EvoLink on the same transcriptional data set, but using the entire annotation, um, including pseudogenes, et cetera, and you can, you can compare um, the output bed files and see uh, how many pseudogenes were coming out. Because pseudogenes are, are probably link RNAs too, right? I mean, their evolutionary profile is maybe different than most link RNAs, but they are still non-coding transcripts and typically intergenic as well. Um, so now the evolutionary context of a pseudogene can be determined uh, using EvoLink2, and I'll talk about that in a second. But, but you can distinguish, especially if the genome annotation is really good, like it is in, in, um, in Arabidopsis or, or humans or mice or something. So you can identify whether a link RNA uh, that's been identified by EvoLink is a pseudogene simply based on genome annotation. Does that answer your question, Zane? It's a rather long-winded explanation. <laughs> may, have, may have lost you, I lost myself. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so now let's talk about uh, EvoLink2. Um, and go back to the presentation. Okay, so we did that. Um, questions? Okay. Okay, so now bringing you back to, again to this this figure that I really like because um, I think it's really informative. It, these these figures pack a lot of data. Um, so I already told you uh, that there have been a lot of link RNAs identified, especially in uh, the mammalian and vertebrate systems. Um, so what this figure also tells us is how conserved these, these link RNAs are. So as you see coming out from uh, humans at the node where uh, last ancestor, uh, shared ancestor between humans and chimpanzees, um, there's a lot of, there's a big blue circle indicating there's a lot of link RNAs that are conserved between these two species. And you see as you go down um, through the mammalian and vertebrate lineage that there are link RNAs that are conserved between these different species. Um, so, but again, uh, as with link RNA identification, link RNA evolution, so the factors that are affecting genome retention, nucleotide conservation, and transcription itself, have pr primarily been identified or studied in vertebrates because that's where the link RNAs have been identified. So all the other lineages are lagging due to lack of curated link RNAs. So that's what EvoLink1 is doing, is it's helping you to curate link RNAs. And you can actually stop with EvoLink1. You don't have to continue and do this analysis. I'll, I'll show you why I think it's a useful uh, app to use, but you could take link RNAs that you identified in, in a species, and then to get kind of more confidence in that link RNA data set, you could do differential expression analysis using the GTF file that we give you. Um, you know, and see if it's, if those link RNAs are highly expressed in a particular uh, tissue or um, if they show a stress response. Um, but there's another factor that I think would help narrow down to uh, a set of functional RNAs. And I think that this, this uh, tree uh, shows that you can use conservation um, as one of those factors. So uh, what, I, I'm not, what, what I'm not referencing here is that there have been a, a couple of studies in, in vertebrates, um, actually, yeah, where they have identified link RNAs that were conserved uh, at the sequence level and then also shown transcriptional, like tissue-specific um, and uh, like functional, functionally uh, conserved roles between these link RNAs over a long evolutionary distance. Um, and in fact, uh, Kapusta and Fischot show that there's at least one link RNA that is conserved in function all the way out across all eukaryotes. Um, and this is a, a telomere-associated link RNA called Terra. And I would argue that there's another RNA that's also conserved functionally across all eukaryotes, and that's the telomerase RNA. So these are both uh, link RNAs that have really um, important functions. I think there's probably more link RNAs out there that are conserved at some level that have conserved and important biological functions. So we've designed an app, EvoLink2, that will help to determine link RNA conservation across a phylogenetic uh, distance of your choosing um, to, again, help fill out uh, this part of the evolutionary or the eukaryotic tree of life. Okay, so just quickly, again, EvoLink1 is going to identify thousands of link RNAs depending on your species. 
Um, we would like to take that data set of link RNAs and identify the ones that are really interesting for functional analysis. We're not saying that, that this pool isn't interesting, but it's a lot to choose from if you're wanting to do like in vivo uh, biological testing. So let's design something that will narrow down from the thousands to just a few, I'm gonna heavy air quotes, interesting uh, link RNAs. Because again, my definition of interesting isn't the same as yours. Um, but let's uh, do this, let's narrow down to an interesting set of link RNAs based on conservation of the link RNA locus, um, at least some part of that link RNA locus, expression of that locus in another species, either as a link RNA, a protein coding gene, a pseudogene, et cetera, um, and then the tissue or treatment specific expression um, in any of these species. That's information that EvoLink2 can take into consideration. Um, some of this may have to be a user provided. It, that tissue or treatment specific expression may not be known in all cases. Um, and then of course, conservation of structural features or protein binding sites. Okay, so let's give a, a general overview of, of the workflow, the pipeline for EvoLink2. So you're gonna start with a query set of link RNAs from one species. You're gonna blast initially to the genomes of other species. You're gonna extract the sequences that, that come back. Um, there's different blast criteria that you can use in EvoLink2. I'll talk uh, to you a bit how you can actually set that in the discovery environments. But um, we initially set a really high um, e-value, like very stringent e-value, um, because we want to try and prevent getting too much noise uh, um, 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 to see whether the sequence that was a hom well, homologous in the homologous sequence in the other genomes um, overlaps with any kind of known protein coding gene, a known link RNA, any kind of transcribed unit. We ask, if, does, that, does this sequence that was homologous to the query link RNA, does it overlap with anything that's known from any of the other species? So then we get a data set of sequences that are annotated, and they're annotated a little bit more uh, distinctly than what I'm showing you here because I didn't quite have enough space on the slide. Um, but so we say, okay, it's present in the genome. It's also present in the transcriptome. And we actually tell you like if it's overlapping a known link RNA or a known gene um, and in what direction um, in the output files. And then for all of those query link RNAs, so going back here, all those query link RNAs that didn't get an, an initial hit, we then break that, uh, that sequence up into 200 uh, nucleotide long blocks and we do a reiterative blast. Um, to each of the uh, subject genomes to see if any of these regions um, uh, also blast to a subject genome. And then, of course, uh, I think what's really uh, necessary here to prevent background noise is to do a reciprocal blast um, of all these sequences blast back to the initial genome and make sure they're all blasting back to the same place. Um, and this helps to prevent spurious hits caused by low E-values. So you can actually re make the E-value uh, less stringent and recover more uh, sequences that are actually sequence homologs that have just undergone a little bit more uh, nucleotide uh, uh, or sequence divergence. Okay, and then we do um, uh, uh, sequence alignment using a MAFT, and we do a, uh, this is with all the homologous loci, um, and then we are going to have a, we don't currently have this uh, live in the discovery environment right now, but we will have a separate app that will um, basically allow for a phylogenetic analysis um, using uh, RaxML of your sequence alignments. Um, and then, um, of course, you have your results. Okay, so let's again hop over to the um, discovery environment and do a demo of this. Okay. That's weird. Everything's in the way. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties of sorts. Um, let's escape out of this. That's what I did wrong. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I, I'm, I'm a noob at this. Okay, so this is a Pindra's output, and we're gonna we're gonna say that you're still logged in, um, and let's go to the apps first. And of course, Evo, um, Pindra searched for um, EvoLink One, 
um, evil link two also shows up because it has the same Roman numerals. Um, but you can search for evil link two, that'll pop up. Um, maybe one of you will come in and give it a, a five star rating. Maybe I'll do that myself, you know, to, to bump up the ratings. Um, okay, so again, the basic uh, gist of the, the user interface is the same. Of course, you have your analysis name. You would, uh, I like to be fairly descriptive in this so that when I go to my analysis window, which you can see Upindra is, it only has 314 analyses. I haven't deleted very many of mine, so I have thousands. So be as descriptive as possible in this, makes it easier, you guys know this. Um, again, there's the user, uh, the readme. You can go to the, um, the wiki page to get more information on um, how to use EvoLink2. Again, I've tried to, or we've tried to be as descriptive as possible in this. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Our emails or e addresses are at the, um, uh, the front page of this, this, web, uh, this webinar. Okay, so inputs. There's a few different inputs, um, and they are pretty important, as you can imagine. So um, we have given you some example data, again, in the data store. Uh, under community data, um, I play collaborative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, example data, and we scroll down to Evo Link sample data. Here we go, Evo Link two. Okay, now let's try and make this a little bigger. Okay, so you will see a lot of files here. Um, and you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, there's so many files. You don't have to know about most of these files. Most of these files are either the genome that you're gonna be blasting to, or the reference annotation file for that genome you're gonna be blasting to, or um, in some cases, there's actually uh, link RNA data sets for that species. So for this example, we've provided you with kind of a mix of everything to give you a, a good um, demonstration of what EvoLink2 is gonna output. So the very first thing that uh, you need is some kind of blasting file. And uh, um, the blasting file is pretty important. So I'm gonna look at that, show you guys it uh, for a second. Um, so the blasting file is really a tab delimited uh, set of columns where that tells EvoLink how to uh, perform its different uh, reciprocal blasts and in what order. Um, so first you have the query, uh, species genome. So we're starting off with Arabidopsis thaliana. That's our, that's our query link RNA data set. Um, so we want to initially blast to that uh, uh, query genome so that we can uh, set up the reciprocal uh, algorithm. Um, we have, so we have genomes in the first column. Then we have what the uh, link RNA uh, data set FASTA file is called, which is sample query link RNA data set. Then in the next column, we have the query uh, species and four letter format. So um, you can use any four letters, but I like to use genus as the, the first level uh, letter. So Arabidopsis thaliana, A, and then three letters from the species for the last three letters. So Arabidopsis thaliana, um, A tha. And this is really useful for EvoLink to figure out um, basically keep everything uh, ordered. So queries, query species, subject species. Again, subject species matches the subject genome. So, um, and then the next column is going to be the uh, reference genome annotation file in GFF format. And the last column is going to be um, any known link RNA data sets in FASTA format. Okay, again, this is a little confusing maybe, um, uh, but we have an example of this in the, uh, on the wiki. So you can just go and look at it and remind yourself. And again, you can just uh, look at the, um, the sample data set as well. Okay, so let's close that. Let's drag it over to the blasting file. Query link RNA data set. Here it's gonna be the, the sample query link RNA data set. It's gonna go there. Input files. So input files is the folder where all of your genomes, where everything is gonna be located. So it helps to have everything located in one space so that EvoLink can easily pull 
uh, the genomes um, and the genome annotation files, et cetera, and do all of its magic. So here we're just going to browse to the EvoLink2 folder. Um, you're going to see, uh-oh, there's nothing in that folder. That's because it's Evo, or the uh, interface is looking for a folder and not actually a specific files. So don't worry that it doesn't see anything there. It's all there. Um, and then a species list. So the species list is also important. Um, so let's look at it. I mean, I guess this is all important. That's why it's required. Um, okay, so the species list is, again, the four-letter formats for all of the uh, species that you're going to be looking at. Um, and you should have it organized. It's not critical, but you should try and have it organized in terms of how these species are related to one another. So for instance, Arabidopsis thaliana, its closest relative is Arabidopsis lyrata. I know that from a lot of, well, I know that because I've worked with this family for a while, but there's a lot of published uh, resources out there on um, different uh, eukaryotic clades and how the species within them are related to one another. Um, and I think we'll probably put up a couple of those references on, on the wiki eventually to make it easier for people to, to figure out how the species that they're looking at are related to one another. Again, this isn't critical. It just, uh, the data that comes out will make a little bit more sense if you have these things um, in the correct uh, order. Um, okay, so we're looking at uh, six additional species aside from our, our query species, so seven species total. Um, so let's go ahead and pull that over. The query label, that's just the Rabidopsis thaliana in four-letter formats. Um, outputs, it's just the, where the folder is going to go, and parameters. So again, I told you that, that that we tend to use a fairly stringent uh, E cutoff value. You can go a lot, a lot lower. You can, so in, for instance, in mammals, they tend to use uh, E to the negative five. They typically have a lot more transcriptional uh, data to support their returns so that uh, it makes it easier for them to go lower. But you would just put in five or 10 or whatever you want, um, and then you would click launch. Of course, I didn't give it a unique name. I always do that right before, and then we'll click launch. Okay, so while that's running, let's look at the um, output that we already uh, put going, or had going. We've got a lot of windows open now, let's, let's minimize these. Okay, so EvoLink2 is gonna give you a lot of information. Most of it is going to be relegated to the output folder, um, because you don't necessarily need to look at the output folder just now. The very first things that you will probably be interested in is the summary table and the bar plots. So let's look at the bar plot first. It's a nice little bit of R magic. Um, actually, I think it's easier to download this um, because then you can um, view it better. And then let's go, where's your cameras? Ah, sorry. Okay. Okay. First thing. Okay, and then let's drag it over. Okay, so here all this is showing you is uh, the percent of the original query uh, link RNAs. How many of those link RNAs had some kind of sequence homolog in an, in another species? So. Um, this is percent on the y-axis and then your different species on the x-axis. And so uh, one of the things that, again, makes it useful if you have the species list in the right order is that you can see, for the most part, that the number or the percent of link RNA or homologous sequences that were identified in other genomes goes down as you get more distantly or more diverged from Arabidopsis thaliana. So Ethionema arabicum is the earliest diverging lineage within Brassicaceae, the family that, that Arabidopsis thaliana is in. It's the most distantly related from Arabidopsis. Therefore, you see the fewest percent of recovered uh, uh, homologous sequences in this, uh, in this genome. But for the most part, you just get a, a nice snapshot. It's not super informative, but it does give you a snapshot of the, the level to which the link RNAs in your system, say you're working in Drosophila, say you're working in some fungal system, or you're working in, in, in a mammalian system, it gives you a snapshot of how conserved your link RNAs are. Okay. Um, 
let's go back to this. So the other and more useful and informative uh, file is the final summary table. And what this is telling you is, okay, so for the query link RNA, so we started out with these link RNAs, um, was it found in a subject uh, species genome? So Arabidopsis, for instance, Capsella rubella, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if it was found, minimally at most, if it was found, it gets the tag homolog. So we consider these things sequence homologs because they fit our criteria and they recipro reciprocally blasted back to the original location in Arabidopsis thaliana. Um, so if it wasn't found, it gets the not found, and you get a sad face. Um, if it was found and it overlaps with a known gene or a known link RNA that you provided, um, then it gets the, uh, the identifier known link RNA or a known gene. And it'll tell you whether it overlaps that known gene in a sense direction or an anti-sense direction. And this goes back to, I think, uh, Zane's question earlier, if you have a link RNA in one species and it's overlapping, sorry, link RNA here in Arabidopsis thaliana, and it's overlapping a gene in all the other, uh, all the other species that you're looking at, it's probably a pseudogene. So then you would go back and you would go to your output. So let's get an example of that. So 31370, uh, we would go, and in the output folder, you're going to see bunch of information, and I think it's actually faster. Well, go to orthologs, go to link RNA families, um, and I'm just going to show you the, the first file for now. This is an actually a FASTA um, uh, sequence file of all the uh, sequences that came out that had uh, sequence similarity to the Arabidopsis thaliana query. Um, and in final results, we actually have the alignments uh, files. Um, and I'm not going to show you that right now, but it's just a basic uh, MAFT uh, alignment of those sequences. And that can be viewed in any, um, uh, so Genius, for example, or any kind, any your, I guess, Mega uh, as well, any alignment viewer. Um, but basically, you would take that sequence, you would look at it, um, and you would um, uh, check to see what gene it was that it overlapped, or what gene it was from the original subject species, and that would give you a lot of information as to whether or not it was a pseudogene or not in Arabidopsis thaliana, or your query uh, species of interest. And eventually, um, in the very soon future, um, in, in addition to having known leak RNA, we'll also give the gene ID of what known leak RNA it overlapped with, or what, um, in the case of a known gene, uh, the same there, so that you won't actually have to go back to the original subject genome or genome annotation file to, to figure that out. Um, okay, so let's go back to, so basically EvoLink2 gives you um, a snapshot of um, what, uh, whether a link RNA, uh, at least the, the sequence is found in another genome, and it also tells you um, if you have that information, whether that sequence, that homologous sequence, corresponds to a known link RNA or to a known gene. Keep in mind that depending on the curation of that genome annotation file, it may be a link RNA in that species of interest. Um, and so having the ID, of course, will, will help. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the presentation because I have a couple of thoughts and uh, a stopping point for questions, which I believe we have a question from Zane. Should we order the species based on furthest away species first, least clade branched species, or should we order the species that has the most clade branched in species? Basically, does the order for placing the name on the, does the order matter? Um, so the order within, so, so basically the way that I like to do it, um, let's go back up to, Actually, right here, this will work. Okay, so this is a fairly simplistic example, but for instance, this is Arabidopsis thaliana right here. This is a query species. This was Arabidopsis lyrata, the sister species to Arabidopsis thaliana. Then you have two species that are essentially equivalently related to Arabidopsis thaliana. These can be in any order. Doesn't matter. This 
in in the example, I think, uh, um, well, yeah. So these don't matter. This matters, and this matters. So if you have species within your tree that are equally related to the query species, it doesn't matter what order. Um, been sitting on about the phylogeny. Um, so uh, I wasn't planning on talking about the phylogeny building stage, but I am definitely open to questions because um, your questions will determine what exactly we do with that. Um, at the moment, we were simply planning on um, integrating uh, uh, RaxML um, so that it was going to use uh, basically a newer format of your species list. Um, so you already gave it the um, uh, the order, the, the relatedness of all the species that you would be using in RaxML. And that's basically all that RaxML needs. Is it needs alignments and it needs, um, um, you know, some kind of NUIC uh, formatted tree. Um, so Amy, what kind of questions uh, do you have about the phylogeny building stage? Would be possible. To perform likelihood ratio. Um, that is a good question. Um, and that is something that we can code into. So basically, um, we will have, again, Evil Link 2 as an app, and then we'll have Evil Link 2 RaxML as an app. And we will uh, make it so that we will make that an option within the app. Um, it's, it's not. Um, yeah, so, so we will make it possible to constrain trees alternative, alternatively um, so you can perform likelihood ratio tests. Um, yeah, so yes. Okay, any other questions? Uh, thank you. I'm using maximum part. Um, potentially. Um, yeah, so I imagine that we will probably, so using RaxML, we will probably set up that particular, um, the EvoLink app so that the different options, most of the different options that are available for RaxML that you can do in command line are available for you to uh, select um, on the app itself um, so that you can provide alternate, alternative topologies, um to yeah so yes we we will try and but but basically it's going to be whatever raxml allows so essentially what evil link 2 is going to be doing is doing a batch run of raxml on all the different um, um uh, alignments that have sufficient uh, taxa um so the reason that we didn't have it um um the reason that we didn't have it included right now is because RaxML can take a, actually, sorry, the reason that we didn't include the RaxML step in the EvoLink 2 app as it is right now is because RaxML can take a really long time if you have a lot of, of uh, query uh, link RNAs you're looking at. So EvoLink 2 can handle you know, thousands of link RNAs, but the RaxML step causes it to go really slow. And so we wanna make sure that the user acknowledges that uh, computational um, uh, hurdle and is prepared for something to take days, you know, to run. Um, so um, I am not familiar with, I'm not familiar with uh, uh, PAU P star, um, but uh, if you email me, um, I can look into this uh, separate, separately and, and we can see um, uh, how we want to integrate that. Um, again, I know what I want out of Evo Link 1 and 2. Um, you know, sorry, we know what we want out of Evo Link 1 and 2, um, but we're still, especially with uh, the evolutionary aspect of Evo Link 2, um, we're still very much interested in what the users, you guys, want. Um, because there's a lot out there, and we've chosen perhaps the most, you know, traditional way or acceptable way, um, but I, I would love to hear feedback on both of the apps. Um, so visit our wiki, visit, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, RaxML, sorry, uh, R-A, it's capital R, capital A, how about I type it in, that'll be easier, um, R-A, our case, in, sorry, no, got the caps on, um, 
There we go. That's easier. I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty standard, it's a really robust uh, phylogenetic uh, uh, algorithm software. Um, tr traditionally available only on uh, command line, but there is, um, there is actually a RaxML app in the discovery environments, um, but we're, we're going to try and integrate, or we already have, we're going to make live an integration of the RaxML uh, program within EvoLink 2. But again, like I said, it can substantially increase the time it takes to run, so we didn't want to include that in the, in the, the first version. Okay, um, so just some take-home thoughts. I've already answered some questions. If you guys have any more questions while we, we consider these take-home thoughts, um, I guess, importantly, this is always a caveat. Conservation is not the only factor implying function. Um, you can have, and there are many examples of species-specific link RNAs that do function in a biological sense that's easily uh, measurable. Um, again, I would go back, read through our, our wiki, but I would go back and I would measure, um, look for sequence, uh, sorry, I would look for tissue specificity, I would look for stress responsiveness, um, any, any other factor from that, that would help you figure out what those species-specific link RNAs are doing. Because in plants, there are a lot of species-specific link RNAs that we found. Um, okay, um, and yeah, um, with that, I think I'll, for quick viewing, you could use a distance base. Mm -hmm, they were joining, uh -huh, but they don't. Yes, so I with, with the RaxML step, I'm really gonna have to um, I was just going to do a very basic output and give the, you know, a, a simple tree that, that's outputted. Um, and, and we used this in a previous publication to, in conjunction with a series, uh, with an application called No Tongue, to determine how prevalent duplication was for link RNAs. So we looked at, um, yeah, duplication and loss using RaxML and then using No Tongue separately on individual trees. Um, and No Tongue, again, is a really good, um, uh, a high throughput way of, of looking at um, trees that are outputted from, from RaxML. Um, okay, so any further questions? I think uh, Martha, um, maybe you wanna, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. sorry, sorry. yeah so sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll go to acknowledgements. Um, and again, uh, need to acknowledge all the organizations that made this possible. School of Plant Sciences at the University of Arizona where I work. Um, NSF, of course, for funding, and really Cybers, both for providing computational resources, but also for organizing this webinar for you guys. Um, and then people within my lab, uh, or Mark Bilestein's lab, um, people who've done beta testing, um, and then at Cybers, um, people who have provided inputs and also helped organize uh, this webinar and all the uh, things that go on behind the scenes. Um, so with that, now I'll turn it over to Martha. Okay. Okay. Well, we're getting well, we're getting feedback. feedback. Andrew, could you? Andrew, could you? I don't know why we're getting feedback. Uh, mute me, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. I I do want to thank Andrew and Upendra for the presentation. Really appreciate that and all the work that they put into it. I'd also like to thank the participants for calling in, joining us, and asking lots of great questions. Um, these webinars are always a lot more interesting when the participants interact. So what I will do after the webinar is send out an email message that has links to all the materials, the slides, um, the wiki page, and the recording of this video. So you can watch for that. And as always, I have a link to a little survey if you want to give us some feedback, we really do take the um, feedback seriously and try to improve these webinars. So with that, I am going to say thank you. I'm going to stop recording and end the video. So everybody wave goodbye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>